All right, well, come on up, guys, uh, all six of you, and uh, sit behind our stylish Greer Herd tables. No, you don't have assigned seats. I don't, it's it's uh, Greer Herd indeterminacy. And... Um, <laughs> All right. Now, um, each one of them is going to have three minutes to, uh, to give us a closing comment, thoughts on, on uh, the subject, the conference, um, life, and, uh, and then we'll t turn to some questions. And somebody asked... Uh, do you have a particular aisle for a particular speaker? Look around. Do you see six aisles? And uh, the answer is no, unless you go up in the balcony. And um, so I think, I think what I would say, um, come ask a question of anyone that you want. And we pretty much know which is team theism and which is team non-theism. And... Uh, and if you ask a question to someone from the theist team, let's say the theist team get that aisle since they did last night, and the non-theists get this aisle, it, and then ask any person a question, and then one representative from the other side can speak for a minute to the question. And I think we can get about seven questions in in the time that, that we have left. And by saying seven, that means we won't have 40 people standing in the aisle who are disgruntled when I call time and say Robert's rules and uh, so forth. So if, if you have questions about, for any of our speakers, please come to the, to the microphones now. now. Go ahead. I guess I'm the only one. Well, I've thoroughly enjoyed being here. My question is, uh, what would you say was the greatest weakness in your opponent's argument? And who, who are you asking the question oh, to? That, that would be to uh, Dr. Carroll and Dr. Uh, uh, Craig, for those okay. two. Well, uh, which one? Uh, I know they both get to respond. So, Dr. Craig, would you go first then? Uh, what would you say was your great greatest weakness in your argument? This Let's give them two minutes apiece if you're asking the same question to each person personally, okay? okay? So the greatest weakness in your argument to this, for this debate, and then the greatest weakness in your opponent's argument. Thank you. Well, I, I suppose that the greatest weakness would be the tentativeness of the empirical evidence that the universe began to exist, um, that would mean that our conclusions are always provisional um, and not certain. And I suppose the greatest weakness I would see in Carroll's argument would be that we do have good tentative evidence that the universe began to exist. Um, so um, the, the uh, necessity of having recourse to um, elaborate schemes to explain away the evidence that we do have seems to me to be a weakness in the other side. I chime in very quickly? So uh, I do want to put it back on the table that I don't think that the universe beginning to exist requires God in any way, so I don't see that as a weakness. I think the greatest weakness in my own case is the weakness that science will always have and that we're not done yet. There are plenty of questions that we don't know the answer to. Certainly, conceptually, it's always possible that someday in the future we'll hit a point where we try again and again and we find that the best explanation we can come up with is not a purely naturalistic one. We have to be open to that possibility. Naturalism is, is extrapolating into the future the idea that we will someday be able to come to such an explanation. I think that's very, 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 very probable, but it might not happen. You know, the greatest weakness in the other side is I think that it, it's, it's pick your poison. Either the universe in which we live looks nothing like you would expect it to look under theism, or you can justify that it does only because theism explains almost nothing about what the universe looks like. Thank you all for being here. You know what? You know what? Sir. 
Yeah. I said we were going to give each person three minutes. And uh, so I guess let's do the question. We'll do uh, seven questions and then give them three minutes each. How's that? Okay. Okay. It's my fault. My bad. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Wittgenstein said the greatest deception of modernism is the idea that laws of nature explain the uh, laws of nature explain the phenomenon of nature. Now I love science, but I think that um, we're deceived into thinking that you know the the sheer power of science. Uh, we we think that science gives us all explanations. Now nobody fully knows what gravity is, or fully knows what energy who is. Who is your question? Fully knows what time is. Um, anybody on the the anti-theism side? Um, well, now here's I here's my direct wanted. question. Here's my direct question. If those things are true, that we don't fully know what those things are, but yet we say science explains, why is science the only explanatory category allowed? What evidence do any of you have that only science can adjudicate full explanation? I'd be happy to, to respond. Um, Explanation is more than the reduction of curiosity. It's not a matter of scratching a psychological itch. One of the features of theism... Alex, they told me that those mics aren't working at the moment. They're working very faint. They're just very faint. Well, I'm very loud. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the... Um, it, it, the reduction of curiosity and the scratching the itch of curiosity is not a criterion of explanatory adequacy. Now, among philosophers, there's been at least 150 years of debate about what the nature of explanation uh, is and what the criteria are for explanatory adequacy. Uh, and about the only thing on which I think there has been significant consensus is that prediction has something to do with it. Uh, not necessarily immediate prediction, certainly not the symmetry of prediction and explanation that the positivists urged, but when you offer an explanation, in order to uh, establish that your explanation is an improvement on competing explanations or does any more than satisfy itches the way the narratives that we were uh, lulled to sleep by our mothers with, you've got to have some predictive consequence. Indirect, direct, eventual, or immediate. And it's because only science holds out the promise of that kind of predictive consequence that its explanations pass that epistemic test. All right. Anyone? Any of the theists? I don't okay. know what, if I, I mean, I can say a word if I have, if you give me I'll let you say more, a word. more than 30 seconds left over. Um, the, you know, the, the, the question seemed to be premised on something I've certainly never asserted. I don't know anyone who has. The main issue isn't can we segregate science and give it all credibility and put everything else on some other side. The question is for every belief, what is the grounds upon which you hold it? And can you see why those grounds would m be reliable or give you good grounds, good reason? Now, one can just say, I would tend to say almost any enterprise that meets that criterion, I'll call a kind of science, right? I mean, mathematics sits in the science department, it's not an empirical science. And it sits in the mathematics departments because what it has in it are proofs. And you think proofs gives you good reason to believe the theorems. So why, you know, why does math sit next to physics? In certain ways, they're completely different. But it's called a science just because it has, seems to have this strong concern about articulating the grounds, the evidence, and so on. From that point of view, the reason why you should only pay attention to science is because by this definition, science are those things for which you have good reason to pay attention to, right? And anything else that you plan to, you know, believe in, it, it just doesn't have, hasn't given the credentials to show that it's reliable or that, you know, that, that however those beliefs were generated, that they're likely uh, or you, uh, uh, to be accurate. So then it's just a kind of you know, nomenclature thing. But I don't think that puts theology on one side or the other. As I said, I can, I can perfectly well imagine good evidence for a theological hypothesis. Sean can as well. Um, it's exactly because we don't see a world that looks like that, that we're not drawn in that direction. 
Questions for Dr. Carroll? Um, I was wondering if you could clarify something regarding the slide last night with uh, Alan Guth. Um, because the way I take Dr. Craig citing the theorem is our observable universe, the one that's 14 billion years old, certainly satisfies the only assumption of the theorem of H average being greater than zero. Um, but by showing that slide, is, is Guth saying that he doesn't believe our universe satisfies that condition? Or is he saying that there's a cyclical model that, that he believes is eternal? or? What, what was actually the, the gist of what he was talking about? Yeah, great. So Alan Guth, um, it, it's not nearly enough to apply the Borde guth vilenkin theorem that the part of the universe we observe has uh, an expansion rate greater than zero. That is one of the assumptions of the BGV theorem. It says that if the universe has an average expansion rate greater than zero, then you cannot extend that behavior infinitely far in the past. So the fact that it extends for 14 billion years tells you absolutely nothing. And when Alan says that he thinks the universe is probably eternal, he's saying, well, there, there's two large loopholes in the theorem. One is maybe the universe has an average expansion rate of zero. For example, in one of these bouncing universes, it's changing all the time, but it's changing one way on one side and the other way on the other side, and the average is zero. Or I think more plausibly, what I suspect he uh, believes in because we're writing a paper together about it, take quantum mechanics seriously. It's just extremely clear to us as cosmologists that the, the, the chance that classical physics is telling you anything interesting and relevant about the very first moment of the history of the universe is very small. You really have to think quantum mechanically. And the borde guth vilenkin theorem only tells you when you need to start thinking quantum mechanically, not what the result of that thinking is going to be. The simplest quantum mechanical models and the ones that have the most promise for explaining cosmological puzzles seem right now to us to be those that are eternal. If someone has a better idea tomorrow, if I have a better idea tomorrow, I'll change my mind about that. But right now, given what we know about the state of the art, that seems to be the way to go. My question is for uh, Dr. Alex. Uh, would you uh, explain for us the uh, concept of irreducible, uh, uh, irreducible complexity as uh, My Michael Behe in his book uh, Darwin's Black Box and uh, Stephen uh, Mayer's signature in the sale? I'm sorry, I don't quite get the question. Do you want me to explain Behe's idea of irreducible complexity? Yes. Well, Behe holds that there are some comp complex combinations of matter that, are, that have functions or causal relations with their environments that are of a sort that they could not have been produced by a set of uh, small blind variations filtered by an environment because there's no adaptive advantage to any one of the components and only an adaptive advantage to the complex combination of the components. That's Behe's thesis. Would you like me to say what's wrong with the thesis? In short, uh, it's an argument from ignorance, uh, ignorance which we are constantly pushing back, and the particular examples that Behe has used, for example, the flagella of the euglena, is one in which we have detailed understanding now of the evolutionary trajectory that produced it, and in which we have some idea of the adaptive advantages of the earlier components. It's quite remarkable that Darwin in the chapter, in the sixth chapter of On the Origin of Species began by saying that the eye is an organ of extreme complexity. It's obvious that a, a half an eye, a quarter of an eye, an eyelash, an iris, uh, a cornea alone would convey no adaption to the creature which had it, and that unless he could provide an explanation of its emergence by a series of extremely gradual steps, his theory was refuted. Darwin said this in 1859 in the sixth chapter of On the Origin of the Species, in which he went on to give a sketch that remains with us as the broad outlines of what we now know in much greater detail to be the evolution of the eye by natural selection, a much harder problem than Beatty's euglena flagella. Good. Sir, Dr. Carroll. 
If you grant that the study of the nature of the universe can be undertaken with at least similar critical rigor in both natural, naturalism and theism alike, what is gained by pursuing such an endeavor with naturalistic presuppositions rather than theistic presuppositions? Well, I think that it's not a presupposition. I don't think it should be a presupposition. I think that naturalism is the conclusion we reach by empirical investigation and trying to understand what is the best framework in which to understand the universe that we see, given the data we have. Uh, as data get better and better, one's best fit model changes over time, which is why I'm happy to say that 500 years ago, the best fit model was deism. But now we know better, given you know advances in physics, in biology, in cosmology, naturalism is the conclusion of thinking about what empirical information tells you about the universe. If you did go in with a presupposition, I would agree. That would be a mistake. It's kind of intimidating to see seven great minds looking back. I include Dr. Stewart in those minds. Uh, so if I mispronounce a word or something, uh, bear with me. Uh, the word's been thrown around uh, a couple times last night, and I think Dr. Craig referenced consciousness. And uh, we've talked about cosmology and origins and beginnings. And to me, in my opinion, I could be totally wrong. And you can tell me that. Uh, it seems that we've been talking about material things for the most part. So I would like uh, someone from both sides, I don't want to label them other than that, to explain uh, where does the immaterial come from in regard to cosmology. Uh, consciousness, belief, act of will, uh, things of that nature. Let me just say, I know on our team there will be wild disagreements about this. So you shouldn't think of us as representing some general state of mind. Um, I think consciousness is the hardest problem there is the relation of uh, conscious states to, the, to, to matter, to the body, is the hardest nut to crack, and there's some reasons, sort of very general reasons to think physics can't crack it. Some people will disagree with me on that. What do we know? We know, we do know some things. We know that if I poke your head in certain ways, which is a physical material interaction, that changes your state of consciousness. We know that your states of consciousness depend in great detail on the material state of your cranium. We know you can get a lesion in a part of your brain that will eliminate nothing but your ability to recognize faces. Now, if you take all that together, it seems to me pretty obvious to conclude that if, you, if your brain is not in any working condition, if it's moldered away, there will be no attendant state of consciousness anymore. Even though I can't explain how consciousness arises from matter, and I'm not pretending I can. I think we know enough about the relation between states of matter and states of consciousness to say, you better have an operating brain if you want to have a state of consciousness, which is why I don't think there's any afterlife. I think it's evident that things such as consciousness and particularly intentionality, the aboutness of our mental states, fits much better into a theistic worldview than into a naturalistic worldview. Because on theism, you've already got an ultimate unembodied mind or consciousness who is the personal transcendent creator of the universe. So the idea that there would be finite embodied minds wouldn't be very surprising on theism. It, it fits in with that worldview, whereas the existence of mind in a naturalistic worldview is much more difficult to uh, fit into that worldview. And I, 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 that's why many naturalists will um, deny the reality of intentionality, personal selves, identity over time, and things of that sort. Do you know him? <laughs> I didn't mention your name. <laughs> consciousness with cosmology. I find it quite amazing that people who believe in um, that consciousness is just reducible to particles 
that they actually take their cosmological theories seriously because all those cosmological theories are, it's just a certain state of the brain. And if that's all it is, it seems to reduce it, um, its significance. Doesn't have, how does it correspond to anything in the world? I think there's really deep questions there if you, if you take that line. All right, this question is for Dr. Carroll, and it's for actually someone that's um, watching on the live stream. Um, he says, if there are multiple models that work for describing the nature of the universe, but no one knows which is right, epistemically, what justifies one to believe one model as opposed to the other? Well, this is the kind of question I suspect that I'm missing some hidden thrust. The, the way that we decide between models is the way that we've developed over the last several hundred years in the scientific method, uh, the hypothetico-deductive method. We try to invent all the different hypotheses that we can, and then we see which of them seem to provide a plausible account of the data. And we, you know, if it's a really, really good account of the data, and it's a really, really simple theory, we say that theory is probably right. If there are different ones that never, none of them fit exactly right, and some of them are a little complicated and ill-defined, then we're more tentative. We say, well, we, there's different levels of credence we give to different theories. But ultimately, it's about hypotheses and comparing them to the data. There is no algorithm that is hard and fast and easily you know, formalizable to decide whether one hypothesis is a better fit to the data. This is a famous problem in the philosophy of science, uh, yet, in the way that science actually works, if you wait long enough and continue to collect more and more data, one theory always gets better and the other theories get worse and worse. And I would say that's what's been happening over the last 500 years with naturalism and theism. Okay, uh, my question will be directed to Dr. Craig. Hi, Dr. Craig. Um, you know, when making conclusions about you know, the beginning of the universe and you know, saying that it has a beginning, I'm still not exactly convinced why I should, you know, go from, you know, the universe had a cause, supposedly, to that cause is, you know, a personal God who cares about us and loves us and so forth. So, yeah, I just, I just want a more clarification on how you get from there to there. Right. I was actually going to say something about that in my response to Dr. Maudlin's paper, but he dropped that part of his written response, and so I cut that paragraph out of my response as well. Um, in my published work, I give philosophical arguments for why mm -hmm. I think that the transcendent cause of the universe is personal. It's important to understand, again, that this is primarily a philosophical or metaphysical argument for a personal creator of the universe. And my primary reason for believing the second premise that the universe began to exist um, is the philosophical arguments against the infinitude of the past. I think there are multiple arguments that make it plausible that the past cannot be infinite. And so for me, the empirical scientific evidence is just icing on the cake. It is just remarkable empirical confirmation of a premise for which we have independent philosophical arguments. Um, and so given those philosophical arguments and scientific evidence for the beginning, we then ask what sort of a being could be um, the transcendent cause of the universe? Well, given those arguments, this would have to be a being that is beyond space and time, is therefore non-physical and immaterial and changeless. Now, metaphysically, there are only two sorts of candidates that could fit the bill for that. Either an unembodied mind or consciousness or an abstract object like a number. But abstract objects don't stand in causal relations. And therefore, it follows that the cause of the universe is an unembodied personal mind. I would also argue, and this relates to the critique of uh, thinking the quantum gravity era is past eternal. Bill, Bill, maybe you can oh. hold that one till. 
Oh, I see, because I'm out of time. All right, well, in my published work, I give two other additional arguments for why I think the cause is plausibly personal. But the data of cosmology are simply relevant to the second <laughs> premise. <sighs> okay, got me on your toes with these guys. All right. Okay, my question is for the uh, speaker who had the Socrates argument. Uh, okay. Um, you argued, you showed the slide that said what's right is right because nature makes it right, correct? Uh, the, that the, what is right and wrong is right in its own nature. It's not made right or wrong by anyone's decision to make it right or wrong, yeah. Okay, so if nature were to create human, humankind, and by definition, th by that definition, my definition of right may be different from somebody else's definition of right. So how do we decide whose definition of right? Okay. Yeah, they're, okay. they're, you're, they're just misunderstanding the word nature here. When I mean it's right in its own nature, I mean of its own essence or in what it is in itself. It doesn't have to do with nature in the sense of natural science. If, if you happen to believe that chattel slavery is fine, and people have over the course of humanity, and I happen to believe it is a moral abomination, I'm right and you're wrong. And that's because of the nature of justice and equity and human dignity. I think that your question was misstated. You, you wanted to ask, how can you decide whether Maudlin is right Correct. and you're wrong? Correct. That's not the right question. Uh, as Dr. Maudlin says, we can have a moral grasp of objective moral values if they exist and our moral duties if they're real and objective. The question, rather, is ontological, not epistemological. It is, why think on naturalism that human beings do have intrinsic dignity and moral value? It's very difficult to see on naturalism why this relatively evolved primate species should be invested with this sort of objective moral worth, and especially why they would have moral duties to, to one another. Where do they come from? Uh, what, who or what lays such prohibitions or obligations upon me? And so a good many naturalists, like Dr. Rosenberg here, will, will say on naturalism there really aren't any objective moral values and duties, and moral nihilism is true. Get used to it. Uh, that's just, that comes with the worldview. So I think this ontological question is, is an important one, and here I think theism provides a real basis for it, because on theism, the good is God. God is what Plato called the good, and that is an objective, transcendent reality independent of social mores and cultural evolution. God's nature expresses itself toward us in the form of certain moral imperatives. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, thou shalt not kill, and so forth. And these then constitute our moral duties. So our moral obligations are rooted in God's commands, and these are not arbitrary, as Euthyphro thought, rather they are reflections of the good, of, of God himself, who is the paradigm and locus of absolute moral goodness. So I think theism makes good sense of human value and dignity, whereas naturalism has real difficulty. Okay. A response was given by someone yeah. else. So let me respond to the respond. I, I, yeah, I, 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 I should get a chance to do this. The argument I gave was that the nature of the good, the good is, is exactly like the platonic good. The platonic form of the good is not personal. It doesn't know about us. It doesn't know about anybody. It didn't play any role in the creation of anything. It is an objective standard. Now, if you think there's a, a, a theological agent who knows that standard and somehow conveyed it, although you don't seem to need to convey it, everybody, you know, every society has come on, on careful thought to realize that murder is wrong, that theft is wrong. It took a long time to figure out that slavery is wrong. That was moral progress. It took a long time to figure out that segregation was wrong. That was moral progress, and it was held up as much as it was advanced by religious doctrines. It, it, right now, we're figuring out that it is wrong to discriminate against people who are homosexuals, and some people haven't figured that out yet. But what you're going to do is figure it out by thinking, by thinking hard. 
And if you believe there's objective truth about it, which I believe, he says it comes with the package. It doesn't come with the package. I think I figure out what's right and wrong by thinking hard. And I don't think a, a God would have the power to make chattel slavery more. It's not a command that even God, just as God couldn't make one plus one equal three. So objective moral values are above that level and separate from it. Okay. Well, that one touched a nerve. <laughs> so. This will be our final question, and then we'll turn it over to our panelists to uh, give their final concluding comments. Dr. Craig, this is specified to you through an uh, audience member watching online, but his question is, if the universe is eternal, does that mean that, that the universe doesn't need an explanation for its existence? Who's that for? Who's that for? Oh, that's for me. No, it doesn't, but it would mean it's a different kind of argument. There are different versions of the cosmological argument that sometimes get conflated. One version is that one I've defended, and I've called it the Kalam cosmological argument because of the Islamic tradition, which developed it during the Middle Ages. This is based on the notion that the universe began to exist, and that since something can't come into being without a cause, there needs to be a primordial cause of the origin of the universe. But suppose Dr. Carroll is right, and that temporal becoming is merely a subjective feature of human consciousness that the universe begins to exist merely in the sense that a yardstick begins to exist at the first inch. It doesn't come into being at the first inch, that's just the front edge of the yardstick. Suppose the universe is like that and just has a front edge. Then the question wouldn't be pertinent, why did it come into being? Rather what we would ask is, why is there a tenselessly existing universe rather than nothing, or rather than something else? That is a form of the cosmological argument developed by Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Um, and this Leibnizian form of the argument seeks for a sufficient reason or explanation of the existence of contingent reality, and it finds it in the existence of a metaphysically necessary being whose non-existence is impossible. So these are quite distinct versions of the argument. And we haven't talked about the contingency argument because that's not an argument to which cosmological data is relevant. That's a purely metaphysical argument, like the ontological argument. But the cosmological data are very pertinent to the Kalam argument in virtue of that second premise, which is susceptible to scientific confirmation or disconfirmation. All right. Okay. Well, let's uh, thank you for the questions. Let's uh, give our panelists a chance to give us any concluding thoughts. We'll give you up to three minutes each and start with Alex Rosenberg and work our way on down to James Sinclair. Thank you, Bob, and thank you all for your attention and for your stimulating questions. Um, it's always a pleasure and an intellectual treat to sit in company like this and listen and learn, um, as well as get a chance to put your ideas forward. I think the last idea that I'd like uh, to put before you um, is this. If, we, if, if there's an intellectual struggle between theism and science, um, and it's the basis of the decision you make regarding uh, your religious values, then you're very likely to find yourself in an unstable equilibrium at best and to fall off that equilibrium in the direction of science. Because when it comes to matters of uh, evidence and reason and argument, science has, is the product of the persistent demand for, science, for evidence, reason, and argument over a period of several thousand years and has become the dominant form of uh, assessment of cognitively significant claims in our civilization across the entire world. And therefore, if you're concerned about your theological commitment, it's far better to ground it on faith than to hope for a justification in science. I'd like to commend the Greer Herd Forum for having this kind of a conference uh, that brings together persons of opposing points of view to debate in a civil 
and um, collegial manner these tremendously important questions. This is a modern continuation of the medieval practice called questiones disputate. These disputed questions in theology were practices of medieval universities where persons of different points of view on important questions would come together, they would publicly debate these questions, and then uh, these questions would be published where they would become the basis for commentary and reaction by other thinkers. And that's exactly what Greer Heard is doing. And so I think this is a wonderful format and forum. Now, that doesn't mean that this kind of debate format is the only type of forum in which one engages. On the contrary, next week, I'm going to be in Chicago at the Central Division meeting of the American Philosophical Association, where I'll be presenting a paper on God and abstract objects, and then I'll have a pair of commentators, and we'll talk about it. That will be a very different sort of forum, a very different sort of discussion, but it's not mutually exclusive with one like this. Similarly, one will often have exchanges of papers in professional journals or in books where these things can be discussed. I say let a thousand flowers bloom. All of these different types of forums are valuable ways in which to discuss these issues. And one of the great advantages of this kind of debate forum is I don't know of any other way that is as effective in bringing this sort of material to the attention of a popular audience. A popular level audience will love to come out and hear a debate uh, on these issues much more than just an individual lecture. It is a, it is a, a way to get the public's attention. And it doesn't matter if anybody changes his mind. You shouldn't judge the success of a debate by how many minds are changed. I think far more important is how many people will be stimulated to inquire further, to begin to read, to take a major in philosophy. And I've met people like that here at this forum. I know that these types of forums are tremendously um, provocative in terms of leading persons to further study and deeper inquiry. And for those of us who are Christians, it can make our faith to be more informed, deeper, and more relevant to the world in which we live. So I, I'm thankful to Bob Stewart and to the Greer Herd Forum for an, a, an event like this and the privilege of participating in it. Um, I'd of course, like to thank the, the forum and, and, and Bob is organizing and Sean for picking me to be here. Um, most of all, I have to thank my wife, who is the one who insisted that I not read the paper. Um, and she was, she was absolutely right. And actually, I want to talk for a minute just at the end to come back to one thing we've, one of the arguments that was floating around, the fine-tuning argument, and just make a point about it. And, and maybe this stuff about if we're all so contingent, if, if humanity evolved, where's human dignity? Maybe it connects in there, too. So there's a tendency to think that if, if something happened really just by chance, without any overarching determining thing that, that aimed at it, that if it's just an accident, then it can't really be significant. So I met my wife by accident, really by accident. You know, we met at a conference. I was only in the conference because another colleague who'd been invited got sick and he couldn't go and he recommended me. And you know, we can all in our lives trace out these funny little things that happened that played a very central role to how our lives evolved. And if you start thinking more deeply about it, our own individual existence are wildly unlikely accidents. I mean, I don't want to get graphic, but uh, when you were conceived, there were a billion other competing sperm in the game, okay? So your existence was a one out of a billion shot right there. And for you to be conceived, your parents had to have been conceived, and it was one out of a billion for them, and so on back generation after generation after generation. By any reasonable standard, we are all here by accident. Does that in any way, now first of all, I could calculate that number and say, look how unlikely it is that I'm here. Could I believe it's by chance? It is by chance. I can believe it's by chance, it is by chance. Does that make my existence less significant? Does it make my wife's existence 
less significant? Does it make my child's existence less significant, less important? That it was a matter of just blind luck over very, very long odds. And the same, I think, is true for the entire human race and for life on Earth. It can be disquieting to realize that. It's hard to take in. But I think you can take it in and maintain a sense of dignity and significance in spite of that. And then you can learn a lot about the world because you don't have this barrier, a resistance to taking in the results of science that come from feeling upset about that. I start now? OK. A couple of comments I want to make. First of all, I do really do not see why um, Professor, what Professor Carroll says about the success of science has undermined theism. It seems just the opposite. If you look back at the scientific revolution, a lot of the inspiration and motivation for the key thinkers, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, was they thought that the universe had a mind behind it, an intelligent mind. And, you know, um, Galileo famously said that um, the language of nature that God endowed the universe with was the language of mathematics. And then beauty and elegance were used as a criterion because they thought, well, you know, God would just create an ugly universe, but a beautiful one at the fundamental level. That has been wildly confirmed just by the success of science. It's truly amazing how successful we have been in not just understanding our everyday world, but when you look to cosmology to understand the very origin of the world. Now, if you really took seriously the complete naturalistic story that we were just here by purely um, chance and natural selection without any guidance, our minds would only be geared be selected for practical sort of reasoning in the ordinary realm, every, to get around in the everyday world. We wouldn't have, as Thomas Nagel has emphasized, any expectation that our intellectual capacities would work to understand the underlying world, and yet they do, incredibly so. So it seems in this larger picture, science, the very Success of science confirms a theistic worldview. Then, when you look to other features we have discovered, that the beginning of the um, universe, and particularly what impresses me the most is the fine tuning, and as I've mentioned in my paper, it seems completely implausible to say that these fine tunings are just a brute fact. They're, they're so, so precise, and it's not, it's not just like an improbability we find with this case of the sperm. It's because we can glimpse, and under a theistic explanation, why that, in, why that occurrence wouldn't be surprising. So it's the difference in sort of level of expectation of theism versus naturalism for those occurrences. And I'm almost out of time, so um, that, I'll just leave it at that. So I'm going to do three quick things first. Uh, first, two errata. One for my fellow team member, Alex Rosenberg. The, um, the guy who figured out stellar nucleosynthesis was Hans Bethe, not Hans Beth, German physicist. Uh, and one erratum for Dr. Craig, because I'm, as, as someone who is interested in the arrow of time, I took up a, a hobby of collecting wristwatches. And so I need to correct the analogy with Timex and Rolex. <laughs> Timex is much less expensive than Rolex, but it is actually more accurate because a Timex is a quartz watch, a Rolex is a mechanical watch, and even the cheapest quartz watch is much more accurate than a mechanical watch. So get that on the table. And the third point is uh, we, we've all been thanking the Greer Herd Forum. I think I, 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 don't, I might have been out of the room if it already happened, but I wanted to explicitly thank Bob Stewart, and Bob was up here making sure that everyone else got a round of applause, so let us please give a round to Bob for doing such an amazing job here today. And so having said all that, rather than, I think the substantive things I have to say are on the table, but 
let me point out that, you know, there's a way of slicing the intellectual pie that puts us on obviously different sides in the last two days, the theism versus naturalism debate. There's another way of slicing it in which we're all on the same side, which is the slicing of who cares? I mean, how is this going to cure cancer or make me a better iPhone or anything like that, talking about Boltzmann brains and fine-tuning and whatever? To me and to everyone here, on, on, you know, up here at the podium and in the audience, I think, all of this stuff fits together and is important. Where the universe came from, how it works, where morals and values came from, how we evolved, this stuff matters. We're, we, we do things as human beings more than just existing from day to day. We would like to understand where we are, and all of us are trying our best to make that understanding happen, even if we end up in different places. Having said that, if there's one lesson that science has taught us about trying to understand the world, it's that we're bad at it. That we human beings do not act in anything like a purely rational fashion. That's why science is so wonderful, because it has developed techniques from double-blind studies uh, and so forth to correct the human impulse to sort of make the data fit our favorite theories. So the one methodological principle that everybody, theists, atheists, whatever, should always be keeping in mind is that if we would like something to be true, if there is something, whether it's conservation of energy or the existence of God, that we think should be true, that is not evidence that it is true. Not only is it not evidence that it's true, it's evidence that we should be especially skeptical of that principle being true. And we should always be keeping that in mind when we try our best to understand this world. Thank you. Aha, I finally get the last word. <laughs> okay. Well, I just want to be positive. I, uh, one of the, my... Um, great concerns is that we're, we, we seem to be so sharply polarized uh, in the United States that I wonder if we're moving in a direction of a post-civil society. And that this is where I really see the value of forums like Greer Heard. Uh, and I feel uh, so privileged to be able to serve on a panel uh, with uh, scholars of this caliber. And and to have had the discussions that we've had, like the one we had on climate change at, uh, at lunch the other day and how your wife and you have such a heart for, uh, for that issue. You know, on the Christian side, there's a ministry called Reasons to Believe that I work with that, that uh, many have a heart for that issue as well because the Bible teaches us that we're supposed to take care of the environment. So there is actually room for uh, cooperation uh, on issues like that. Uh, even if we don't fully agree, you know, the, on uh, uh, on the approach uh, to take, but it was definitely a privilege. Uh, I wish I had not had some chance to talk to Dr. Rosenberg more often, but I'm definitely going to read your book. Uh, one thing that I'm really pleased about is that you make what I would call a proactive or affirmative case for atheism, rather than just treating it as a default position. I I think that's that's valuable. That's something. Uh, that uh, I find valuable. And for Dr. Carroll, I hope that, uh, that this has been a positive enough experience that you continue to do this and have uh, these types of dialogues and that, that uh, yeah, you find them positive and continue to, continue to talk to us theists. Yes, we have our warts, and, uh, but um, we appreciate talking oh, to you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Right. Okay, well, James, I get the last word. <clears throat> and thank you all for recognizing I'm such a great guy. <laughs> We're going to do uh, something real quick. I call it the wedding picture. I, I just like to get a picture of the whole group together with me and every year. So come stand on the, the stairs. Uh, uh, put the people... Let's see... Um, what we call vertically challenged in the front and, uh, and pe tall people like Sean in the back and um, 
and we'll get that done. But then also, let me, let me say a, a quick word. We know you guys want to come uh, shake hands. Uh, let's walk on down here. Come here, Tim. And, uh, but, but we do know that, uh, that you want to talk to them, and they're going to be around to talk to. But this is exhausting. Uh, when, you, um, when you get out in front of people and talk, that's exhausting. When you talk about personal opinions that you hold deeply, uh, that's exhausting because you're putting more emotion into it. When you interact with other people who feel equally deeply about their personal opinions that differ with yours, that ramps it up another level. When you carry it over from one night to the, to the next day, that ramps it up to another level. So we're going to try and get them out of here in about 15 minutes. And, and I'm going to ask you to respect that. I know some people will... Uh, what's that? You're making me tired just talking about it. <laughs> well, I am a Baptist preacher. So... <clears throat> But, um, you know, so I know that means that some of you will not get all the time you want with, with a particular speaker and so forth. I, I can't help that, but, but you've had the privilege of being here, and I think that's great. And we thank you for, for coming. So. All right, we're done.